Welcome back to the Back in Time podcast. I'm Kyle, joined as always by Jeff, JD, and one of our favorite guests of all time on this podcast, Chris Clues. Welcome back to the show, man. How you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Favorite guests, one of your favorite guests of all time. You guys don't know me very well, I guess. <laughs> not a large, not a long list to choose from, I think, either, but that's all right. <laughs> hey, well. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff laid in some zingers early on. Yeah, what's um, up with that, man? Yeah, wow. You, well, look like Epi- floating, you look like a floating head over there. <laughs> Let's have a- Jeez, guys, guys, we're supposed to be here for for. It's a Halloween days. special. Floating is- heads are all about yeah. it. Like that's what. Yeah. Make it like a high, make a hiney ho. <laughs> Kyle looks Your, like a door. Uh, camera attached like a walkie-talkie. Like, what's going on here? Um, well, thank you guys for joining us. This is episode two seventy, and we are talking about our top five villains from 80s movies i can't wait i call it the ultimate villains because i think we're going to have a pretty amazing list here and uh, before we do real quick chris is on tonight also to uh help promote his book which is out everywhere you can get it at amazon you can get it chrisclues.com i actually if i can take my background off i can show you a little something here boom oh yeah raised on the 80s 30 wow. unexpected life lessons from the movies and music that define pop culture's most excellent decade. And if you turn in a couple pages, you'll actually see a little something from the Back in Time crew um, in there. But, man, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun going through this. Uh, for me, it's, you know, word by word. I'm on page four. But um, in, a, in a few months, I'll finish this thing up and give you a nice review. <laughs> I appreciate it. You can give me the review before you finish it, you know. Right. You can go on Amazon and just give me the review. A year later, you'll catch a story from me, and I'm like, and finished! All right! Well, well it was after Chris put out the it, audio think, version, but I got through it. I got through there it. are pictures of me from the 80s, if that helps you yeah. kind of move along. So. <laughs> so obviously, everybody should go check out the book. Um, you know, Chris, give everybody a, a little sneak peek into, you know, what they might expect in uh you know basically volume three of your series and you know why this one's a little bit different than the first two yeah this one was a lot more fun for me because it's life lessons rather than workplace lessons although our work and our lives intersect quite a bit so there are some lessons that could be nope. <laughs> oh no <laughs> removed from stream is there a five second delay <laughs> um so there <laughs> so there's like um there, there are some, you know, there, there are some lessons that intersect the, the two of them, both work and life. But um, I really enjoyed this one because there's a bit more of a memoir in it as well. And so if you were around in the 80s, you're going to be nostalgic for it. If you weren't, you're going to learn some things about the 80s that maybe you didn't know. There's a lot of pictures in it. Um, self-deprecating humor is the best humor. So you're definitely going to see some pictures of me from the 80s with my prom date, for example. Um, she got the book and she was bragging about it online. And then I was like, by the way, you know, there's a picture of you and I in there when you had your big hair. She went, Oh no. So, um, that kind of stuff is fun as well. And, uh, and then just the, I have a chapter about a musician Prince and some great lessons that he can teach us. So that mixed it up a little bit. Also, I've heard of that guy. He was pretty good. Yeah. He's all right. He did okay for himself. Um, yeah, I, I think everybody should be checking out the book. It's it's a great gift, too, for the holidays. So if you have somebody in your family that loves the 80s, pick up the book, throw it in the old stocking, and uh, let them you know, read into the new year as we cruise into 2023. Just sounds weird. We're getting further and further from the 80s, but I feel like we're getting closer and closer because it's never been more popular. It's, it's getting stronger thing. and stronger. It's crazy. It's wild. And by the way, just if you're wondering if there's going to be an extension of the 80s, the uh, Goonies 2 is slated for release in 2027. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, you, you know, you've got another four years of the 80s at least yeah. coming at you. So, oh, man, old Fell Dog and Brolin, they'll be in their 70s by then. I still, I'll watch it, whatever. Whoever's still alive will be in it, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> or CGI generated. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Corey's still got a great voice, which is, yeah, CGI him in. We'll yeah. Be good to go. So, um, yeah, everybody check that out. Now, obviously, we're here today to talk about the the villains from the 80s. But before we do, I want to get to one of our new segments of the show, Stream It or Leave It. I know everybody's going to have um, a good one to throw your guys' way. Jeff, I'm going to let you start us off just because, I mean, this is kind of your baby. 
Um, you're the one that decided to give this a go and so far so good. And I know we had a little bit of a name change, but you know, lead everybody in on what we're doing, what the rules are, and then I'll let you uh, lead off with the, the first one. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, we had a lot of confusion about pass or gas. Uh, a lot of people kind of asking whether or not is pass the good thing or gas the good thing. I was like, ah, we'll just rename it to stream it or leave it. So that way we've kind of modernized and updated the title. So again, if we're streaming it, that means it's worth streaming or liking it. Uh, if we leave it, I think it kind of speaks for itself. Leave it in the dumpster. Hit that delete button. Okay. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start off with my stream it. Uh, it's actually uh, about a music company called Spotify. And Ooh. it's currently on Netflix. It's called The Playlist. And it's a very unique way of telling a movie because the scenery or the, the way it's shot and the way it actually just plays out is almost like Spotify because it starts off with the creator, the director, the money, the legal, the tech, the artist. And it works out really well. Um, and it's just shot so precise and amazingly. And a lot of it just was just to save money. So, for example, is they'd cut and close a door and then all of a sudden they'd be in a new room or a new scene. So it was uh, really interesting and, um, you know, not really knowing a lot of, you know, Spotify itself, but it, I, I mean, it probably was the game changer that a lot of people probably didn't know about out there. Cool. I've not heard much about this, but I have saw the graphic on Netflix. I think it's in the top 10 right now. So yeah. Cool. Well, uh, one morning it is, uh, it's because Spotify is a Swedish company. Um, it is uh, subtitled and dubbed uh, for I'm English. So, to to quote the great Mark Cuban, and for that reason, I'm out. Reading, I mean, you know. <sighs> yeah, well, we all know that. <laughs> Jeff, you're frozen. <laughs> I'm gonna throw you on mute as you freeze up. JD, what were you saying? Yeah, just doubling down that you can't read. Yeah. We know this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I'll follow. stream it just because I invested in Spotify. Oh, um, cool. so I'll say stream it, stream it, stream it. <laughs> Pepe Le Pou. No, oh, this, wee -wee. That's oh, wait, wrong, wrong, wrong. Completely wrong. different wrong. country. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh well. Um, <laughs> Jeff, you may unmute now. You are welcome back as you are no longer frozen. Well, he's still frozen. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, there he is. All right. Yeah, there oh, there's go. a delay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that walkie-talkie camera. We knew that would happen. Uh, JD, I'm going to throw it over to you if you want to uncover your mouth. You may uh, give us your – what's your stream it or leave it, man? Uh, I'm going to go with my stream it first. It just ended the first season um, just recently. We haven't talked about it yet. I don't know where any of you stand, but House of the Dragon. Mm. Mm. Any fans? Uh, yep. One fan right here. I'm actually a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan. I'm a huge fantasy fan, and I never watched Game of Thrones. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I tried for a couple either. of episodes, and I was like, I, I can't. I can't do this. Yeah. Get... It's a little tough to get into. But House of the Dragon, I thought... It's well produced. The acting is delicious, and the mystery is even better. So I have no idea what season two is going to bring, and I'm I'm here for it. So stream that shit. What um, what what time frame or what like what century are they in? It's two hundred years prior to the Game of Thrones, so okay. way, 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 way back in right. time. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not the biggest fan of those types of movies. I think we've talked about this a lot, like 300. Like I just have no interest in that time period at all. But, um, but it's yeah, but I hear it's a good and... show. That, I mean, it, it, to each their own. Okay. Yeah. You realize it's, it's fantasy, so it doesn't belong well, to a specific. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. It's important to me that you understand that it's not real. 
Right. But, and, and, and by and, the way, right. Well, 300 you know, is real. We talk <laughs> they about were Romans. Shows, we talk yeah. about these shows being like middle ages or whatever, but the reality is they could actually be a thousand years in the future. We don't know what the future holds. No. Well, uh, that's a horse of a different color. Yeah. That, 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 that's something that would be deep. That'd be a deep, deep conversation. But Kyle, go back to Indiana. <laughs> well, I'm already there. So, okay. Um, well, I'll go next. I want Chris to go, to go uh, give us his pick last year since he's the guest. So uh, mine is going to be a stream it, and it is on Amazon Prime, and it is a show called Life After. So it's a, it's a documentary, and I believe they've got 10 episodes, you know, eight episodes, and it's, uh, I'll give you the tagline here, Life After Chronicles, the lives of 12 former NFL athletes as they venture and decide to take on um, after retirement from the sport. So um, they've got a couple of pretty notable guys on there, Demarcus Ware, it kind of catches up on his retirement after he left the Cowboys, one of the uh, better linebackers in the history of the game. Uh, Thomas Jones is on there, Bears running back, and a bunch of guys. And it's it's really cool. Um, I just finished watching an episode with a, a tight end. His name was um, Bear Roscoe. He was a tight end for like the 49ers. He's now um, a steer wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, he's in the rodeo and he like jumps off of a horse and wrestles a steer to the ground now. And it's just, it's really interesting what some of these guys are doing and, and how much of an adjustment it was for them after leaving football. And like some of them dealt with like depression, like suicidal thoughts, like alcoholism, like so, and it's actually produced by Thomas Jones, who is now an actor and um, a producer as well. So He's done a, a lot of cool things after his career, and he was one of my favorite running backs since Walter Payton left the Bears. So um, there you go. I would highly recommend it. You don't remember uh, Thomas like Jones, J.D.? He was there while we were I just You say Walter Payton left the Bears like it was like this big well, retired. forge. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. He retired. <laughs> he didn't leave the Bears. Well, you know. Exactly. Yeah, he, right. he, he retired a retire. bear. <laughs> yeah. Left by you, old old age, and in NFL terms, means like thirty four. <laughs> well, I, you make it it's sound insane. like when my dad left the family, and it was a big deal. Well, that that's what's kind of cool about the show is that, like, you know, some of these guys that work with them now, they're like, I mean, these guys finish, and they're like, some of them are twenty nine years old, and they're being put out the pastor, like, hey, you're you're done working, like you don't mention mm -hmm. retirement to a twenty nine year old, and most of them didn't make enough money to actually retire, so it's kind of a weird position <laughs> to be in. Yeah, that sounds cool. I, I saw a preview for that. I definitely want to check it out because I was a big fan of Thomas Jones as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, he's great. JD's going, I don't even know who that was. No, I think he went to Virginia, actually. Yeah, he's a yeah. uh, college, I want to say college football Hall of Famer for sure. Yeah. And then um, he had a brother that played in the NFL too, the Jones yeah. brothers. So, yeah. yeah, I do know he, he did retire as a Jet. I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, definitely check that one out. Um, Chris, how about you? Stream it or leave it? What do you got? I got to stream it. Mine is about, I think, a year old, but I'm going to talk about it because it has to do with the 80s. And, um, well, partly the 80s. But it's Val, the documentary on Val Kilmer. Oh, if you have yeah. not seen Loved that. It. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't seen it. I just will say that the thing that I took the most from it Besides the fact that, you know, he's struggling like he is, and it's really weird to see Iceman the way that he is, particularly when you see Tom Cruise doing the things he's doing and how, how the different paths, just based on health issues, like it's crazy. Like your health is so important and what it can do and the difference in a healthy person versus somebody who had something happen to them. It's just incredible to see that, that path go like this. But the thing that stuck out to me the most was his younger brother who passed away, he drowned. And they talked about that. And that, I mean, I just feel like sometimes you look at somebody, I think he was 14 when he passed away, the creativity that he had in his brain, the artwork that he did, the directing he was already doing with their camcorder. I, that, it's, there's no telling what he could have done. In my mind, I feel like he would have done even more than Val Kilmer did. And we never got a chance to see that. And so that was really what I left the, 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 the uh, show with. But yeah, awesome, awesome documentary. Yeah, I mean, shoot, put put that guy in a room with uh, River Phoenix as two guys that, like, had so much talent. 
you look at that, you know, Joaquin obviously has become like an Academy Award winning actor and arguably was not the best actor in the family. That would have been River. Yeah. So. Yeah. Val, sure. Val, Val's just a great, you know, if it, you know, I'm, I've always been a big fan of Val Kilmer and I'm even a bigger fan now just seeing how his yeah. kids, his kids adore him. I was going to say, I'm, I was a big Val Kilmer fan and I walked away from that being a bigger Val Kilmer fan and me even too. more excited to see him in Maverick because I watched it right before Maverick. So yeah, me too, man. Just, yeah. Seems I believe like that's good... on prime. It's on prime. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah. on okay. prime. Yeah. Cool. It seems like a solid dude. So absolutely. Okay. Now, does anybody have a leave it that they want to throw out there? Cause all I had was a stream it. I, I can jump in. I, I recently started watching or rewatching I, I had tried it in the past but american horror story streaming that and i'm okay. on season two of american and it's spooky month but oh my goodness that's that's tough watch it's it's horrifying although i will tell you if you want to watch a really great season um coven i think it's season yeah four uh, or five. I Dude, yes awesome and, okay. and just for the Stevie Nicks appearances alone, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You said season four or five? Yeah, yeah it's actually it's, season three. Okay. Is it season three? Coven. Yeah, they came back strong after season three because season two was terrible after it's a strong a... first run out of the gate. And now they're on – I mean, it's been up and down since then, and now they're on season 11. But, yeah, season two is kind of uh, – uh, and, again, only being – committed to the show that's why I even i'm still watching it but like i said it's been up and down each season and now they have spinoffs off of it um but yeah yeah so and season I, I, nine i think was 1984 so of course yes you know, which was i'm really gonna love good. that one yeah, yeah. i mean but it's, it's, it's like 80 yeah. more episodes jd it gets i know good. it i know it and Just it's it's it tough for me to to support <laughs> it but i'm i'm here for it um <laughs> but if you ask me my opinion Season one was D. Season two has been. Yeah, it's a thing. Watch, watch season three and season nine. Okay, like, that would be my recommendation. On yeah, American Horror Story. Absolutely, I can strongly agree yeah, with so that. Let me throw this in for JD's pick. <laughs> oh, somebody stepping a duck. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, calm down, Joe Little. <laughs> it's your last name or your crotch size? <laughs> our our football coach used to say that to him. Sorry, it's a real uh, real person, real joke. Yeah, I would say I have a leave it, but it's a few years old. And I was, and if you watch it, you're going to be so upset with yourself in the last episode. And mm. it was the OA. Oh man, Gosh, yeah, that's been a couple years. I don't. It's been a couple years. Yeah. But just don't do it. Don't do it to yourself. <laughs> it's this great show, and then the last episode you're like why why yeah kind of like the uh, end of dexter I'm like what are you doing yeah, what are you yeah. Doing? like yeah i was gonna say a little bit like game of thrones as well <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> yeah I, I wanted to get your take on this chris so last last time we did this segment one of our picks was the jeffrey dahmer series that's out right now and one of my fears was that we were going to start making this guy into some type of hero and i'm starting to see it and it's making me angry and um, I'm seeing some places are like banning, like I think eBay's banning the sale of like costumes and stuff because people are trying to dress up for him as Halloween. As somebody that kind of lived through that time period, can you talk a little bit about how awful of a human being he was? <laughs> and maybe why people should not be putting him on a pedestal? I mean, you're talking to a guy who like just absorbs true crime stuff. Yeah. So, um, Son of a know, gun, Chris. My sister, my sister <laughs> and I, we all like just absorb this stuff. I, what I can say about that um, is that on the one hand, I can see where people are saying we're glorifying guys like Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, you know, Ted Bundy, obviously they did a Ted Bundy movie. We're glorifying these guys. We're putting them up on a pedestal. We're, we're making them these, you know, quote unquote heroes. On the other hand, I also think it's important for people to see how horrific these guys were and you can read about it. But if you didn't live through that time period where we had all these serial killers at this, I mean, the eighties were like, again, so many things the eighties had. Um, I feel like the eighties did everything good or bad to the largest scale. Right. And that included serial killers. Cause we had the night stalker, which was probably one of the most horrifying guys ever. 
That and if you ever watch the documentary on the Night yeah. Stalker, which I would actually recommend because they don't glorify him. Yeah. It's the two detectives that were chasing him down. And the one detective who was this hard scrabble, like beat street, beat cop guy, um, big dude. And when he got him in the interview room, he got Richard Ramirez in the interview room. And he's basically said, can I swear here? Are we cool with that? I'm lying. Fuck yeah. Let him fly. So, uh, Anyway, he says basically like I'm looking across this guy and he's not breaking. Like he's just like whatever. And then he said, then I bring up his family and growing up as a kid. And he said, the guy puts his head down and he looks up and it's not even the same person. And he looked like the devil. And he said, if this, he said, I've been in rooms with a lot of tough guys. He goes, but I'm gonna tell you something right now. I was in the room with the devil. He's like, if this guy gets up, if this guy levitates, I'm getting the fuck out of here. But that was horrifying. <laughs> how terrifying that guy was. Yeah. And it goes to show you that these people, Dahmer, whoever, like they're just not, they, they were born in a human form, but they are not human. Like there is mm. something it's completely different than, you know, the person who, you know, kills somebody for whatever reason. We were talking about like people who are gone and from the very beginning. JD, who looks like a serial killer. Go ahead. Thank you so much. That's the <laughs> second nicest thing you've ever said to me. Mm-hmm. First, nice. Is, uh, I won't repeat that one because it's not for audience ears. <laughs> Let's just say, uh, um, but seriously, no, Chris, you bring up a great point because I think that what Halloween ends, which we just did an episode for last week, tried to do spoiler alert with one of the characters. I forget the guy's name, Gary or Courtney or whatever. It was bad. Let's all forget it. Um, is they try to they try to create a character that has that exact moment in their soul where they move from being a human form to being a devilish creature, and it's just interesting because I, I I agree with you and there's there's a there's a great movie out there called um, the Black Coat's Daughter, um, which is about a a young lady being possessed by the devil and and there's a moment in that movie this is this is like super unique where she gets possessed and she goes when that they go to exercise the devil out of her or a demon or how whatever you believe that that goes she's remorseful to the fact that this spirit is being brought out of her body and she's like no we're united we're together like this is what i am now and i wonder if there's something to be said for this is a really deep conversation so i'm sorry guys <laughs> it's a halloween conversation in some ways i mean, yeah. I mean if if there because i think i don't think that dahmer glorified him at all i don't i think it laid the pieces on the table to say this is what happened yeah and I think it did an excellent job of illustrating his victims and who they were and gave yes. them names yes. and personalities. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I wonder if there was a moment, because like even at the end, I don't know if you're at the end yet, Kyle, where, where he goes through his final trial. Is he like that, like, no, keep this demon with me or no, take this demon out of me? I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm going to throw two things out real quick, and I know we want to get to this thing, but, you know, our, so t- talking specifically about Dahmer, if, if, if you are somebody who, if your impression is that he's being glorified, then, I don't know, I feel like people need to do some introspective work on themselves, because th- that's not what I'm getting out of it. I'm getting out that maybe it's because Evan Peters did just a ridiculous job of acting that he should win some awards for, um, that he became so almost he's him in so many ways. But I think that if people are like, Oh, it's glorifying. I think you got to look inside yourself. Cause the JD's point, like we got the victims names and faces, their personalities, who they were, the neighbor who was begging the police to do something like there's some, this, there's something wrong here. And they never did. And I saw an interview with her recently, a couple of years ago, the, the real lady. And, you know, these are, she's a hero in so many senses of the word, but we don't hear her story unless we see something like this. And I want to point out one more thing. Our society has um, been fascinated by this type of behavior since Truman Capote's in cold blood. Um, 
And it's, that goes back to the fifties, by the way, you know, that's what natural born killers, I think maybe was based on, but you know, th th we've been glorifying this for years. Ed Gein was in the fifties. He's the one that the Texas chainsaw massacre Leatherface is based on. So this is nothing new in our society. I just think that, that it's because it's, because we have taken serial killers and they are the very worst of us and they are the scariest of us that we are somehow by human nature going to be fascinated by them. And so I just want just to add one more point to that too. And I think that I, I agree with you, Chris, I think we're 100% on the same page. So let's cheers. Clink. Um, I think that uh, I, I feel like that people have a problem with the emotional reaction that they have because the show did humanize. Jeffrey Dahmer was a human being who went through a shit ton of stuff. And I think people are confused to responding to the fact that he was a person who became demonized and did some horrible, a lot of horrible mm -hmm. shit. And not, let's not forget, he got his comeuppance, okay? So, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay? So, you know, he definitely got his comeuppance. And we can't say that about every one of these people who do the things that they do. Um, back in the day, in the 80s, um, we took care of serial killers the way that they probably should be taken care of. Uh, you know, but that's not necessarily the case today. And so, you know, we, I think he, you know, he got his comeuppance. And I think everybody just needs to keep that in mind. Like, yeah. You know, you know, it happened for him and it mm -hmm. didn't happen in a nice way. No. Yeah. And I think my whole point too, I just don't want to see like 10 year olds walking around with like a Dahmer mask on. That's the only thing I don't like about it. I think the but they walk awesome. around with Jason, Jason masks on. I know. Michael Myers I know. Masks. But they're right. fictional. And, he was and really one of the biggest but, movies yeah. of the sixties was psycho. True. Yeah. I mean, this is nothing new. Like that's, yeah. I guess my point. I know. So uh, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's <laughs> no, man, no, I, no, no. I, I, it's the world we, we get you. In. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I complete. Look, I'm, I'm I mean, Chris. We're on, you and I. We're on the same page. I feel like Kyle, Jeff, as as parents, you maybe have a little bit of a different angle. <laughs> like that could be it. <laughs> but I mean, listen. How, what? What? what I, I'm I'm not a. I don't know like all my centuries. But what century were the Grimm brothers? Ooh, I could do a quick. 1800s. Yeah. But no, 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 exactly what Chris is saying. Yes, yeah. as a parent, as a if I was a parent, it doesn't matter. It's how the person is going to look at them and whether or not if you're going to glorify them or not. There are people out there that love serial killers, that actually like them as people. You don't well, hear about <laughs> right. That's the problem. You don't hear about them because no one wants to talk about them. But that's the glorification part of it. People covering it in the media, people covering it in entertainment and movies, that's not glorifying it. That's informing people about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing that need is, that need, people need to see of uh, being entertained uh, being versus being informed. And that's where I feel that these movies get, you know, this wraparound because you're looking at these people and saying, oh, there's no way that's true. Yes, it is. Yeah. Literally. That's the part, right. Yes. And, you know, and I leave it almost something on kind of even, you know, another note. I watched a documentary on the the Kurt Cobain, you know, suicide, uh, which is coming up on, yeah. you know, 20 some years. Are you going to air quotes that for us? Because yeah. that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly right. Yeah, suicide. Right. But again, it, it's it's that's that the Seattle you know, police department rushed to a judgment, but yet there's all this evidence out there. But, but again, it, it's not glorifying anything. It's informing people of the truth. And that's where people need to step back. And, you know, people are going to believe what they're going to leave, but that's where they need to get the, the word glorification. You know, like I said, entertaining versus informative. That's the way you have to look at it. It's a great point. You know, you make a great point. And, uh, and I think that's where we have, that's where the lines are blurred a little bit today. Yeah. Uh, however, I would say also again, like the Grimm brothers go back, read Hansel and Gretel, like actually read that, <laughs> actually read the words to Hansel and Gretel. My dad used to read me. I'm a huge Edgar Allan Poe fan being from Baltimore, huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, but my dad used to read me Annabelle Lee. Now Annabelle Lee, let me tell you about Annabelle Lee. 
Annabelle Lee is a great poem, but it's about a guy whose wife dies and he like keeps her body around. Okay. Like yeah. last dance of Mary Jane, the, the, uh, the Tom Petty video, last music video that is based on Annabelle Lee. So this, we've been fascinated with the horrifying and the insane forever. But I think Jeff, you make a great point that in today's world, the lines have been blurred and for some people they're not picking up that there's information here this is not when they're looking at it and saying yeah i i, I want to glorify this person we probably need to keep an eye on them i'm just saying like that's you know somebody you might want to just like you know pay attention to on social media but <laughs> the, the, the blurred the blurred lines is a real thing i think for sure sure yeah it's a good point okay that was fun I like that. That was great. It was a great sidebar, side quest, if side you will. Quest. Side quest, yeah. There we go. JD's other project. So, very cool. Um, well, let's do this. Um, let's transition into the top five ultimate 80s movie villains. I may even clip this out separate, so some people may just be catching this part of the podcast, and some may be watching the whole thing and, and hearing our whole sidebar into uh that's a good idea to some really great stuff now <laughs> here's what we're gonna do we're all gonna give five picks hopefully they're all different hopefully they're all totally awesome i think they will be uh, i'm just gonna go based off of our screen so i'll go first jeff will go second jd will be third chris will bring in the runs he'll be the rbi guy because i right. feel like he's gonna outperform us on every pick but <laughs> <laughs> past experiences would tell us that's probably going to be true now um, I'm going to start us off with my number five pick here, and I am uh, picking from a movie from 1987 starring a uh, very well-known actor named Arnold Schwarzenegger. But of course, we're here to talk about the bad guys, and this bad guy in particular is a, a bit of a predator, and uh, oh. I think what kind of sells us in this um uh, iconic character this monster if you will is his amazing armor his weaponry mixed with his ability to camouflage and make him a formidable foe and quite frankly one that scared the living bejesus out of me as a young kid so uh, my number five pick is the predator played by i'll get his name um, but i know he was i believe seven foot two the guy that played uh the predator and I will grab his name here. Do you know who the original Predator was? I do. <laughs> yep. John Gunn Van Damme. Who is yes. not seven foot two. No. Nope. Not even I've, I've close met it. He's not seven, seven foot two. two. How tall I did, secu I did security is? for him. I did security for him back in the day. So. Oh, that's okay. awesome. I stand corrected. Yep. Uh, Kevin Peter Hall, who played the Predator, was seven foot four. And uh, you may also know him from a uh, another awesome uh, 80s movie as he played... Um, uh, oh my gosh, I've drawn a blank on, dang it, on his the freaking character, uh, uh, Harry in the Hendersons. He oh. also plays Harry. So awesome. There you go. He also was the helicopter pilot at the end of the movie as well, asking yeah. if, you know, the girl was all right. But yeah. Great there choice. Great choice to start us off. There we go. That's my number five pick. I didn't think anybody would uh, object to that one. So, JD, you look yep. confused or possibly that you smell something strange i don't he's know doing, he's doing um, his best he's doing his best harry from harry and the hendersons uh, jeff let's slide it on over to you man number five what do you have <laughs> well even though i am going second i feel i have to say it again and i say twice well wait that's three times now but i never even say the name but i guess i'll say the name now <laughs> beetlejuice <laughs> 1988, Mike Keaton's probably best performance ever, or wow, top, awesome. top, you know, um, can't wait for the remake that's been in talks for God knows how many years, um, but uh, that's uh, my number five, um, you know, uh, it, enjoy that, yes. Well, Great pick, although I would tell you to watch Mr. Mom if you haven't seen it. Pretty good <laughs> role. I've seen Mr. Mom, yes. Okay, all right. It, en it ends kind of weird, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's he's going to be multiplicity. Me. Oh, Jesus. Multiplicity. The, guy, the guy played a snowman. I mean, he can he can do everything. 
That's you right. can. Yes. Beetlejuice is a good one, and there's a new one coming out. So good choice. Yeah. It does. Is that going to have um, Tim Burton on the helm for that one, or? I hope so. Yeah. I really hope so. Yeah. Um, he's not least... working with Disney anymore, so if Beetlejuice just is part of Disney, that. he's not going to do it. So. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't. I don't think they're 20th century. He might be okay. No, it was Universal. Be, it's no, Universal. Universal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beetlejuice good. Beetlejuice is Universal because I took a picture with him at Universal Studios. I hope. Well, so. I, I think it was him. It, Fantastic. All right, JD, number five, what do you have, man? I feel like so okay, so just to, to, to blow this conversation up just for a second, we've done bullies, we've done general villains in the past, and I'm trying to be as keeping Chris on his as toes as much as possible. And then this is a movie that I believe we've talked about with him, or I've 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 dropped it in the past. Um and I, I'm gonna drop it again. He's number five because I don't think he holds a candle to the other four that I've got on my list. Mm. Uh, 1986, The Night Slasher from Cobra. Oh. Ah. Oh. Love it. That guy was terrifying. He yeah. was. He yes. really was. I still have the little nightmares about it. He was terrifying, man. He really yeah. was. And the, he played – he was in Mortal Kombat too, wasn't he? Uh, Brian Thompson played uh, – Oh, the the guy with the forearms. Oh, no, no. Um, not the forearms. Oh, yeah. I can't think of the name. Shao Kahn. He played Shao Kahn. That's who it is. He yes. Was, that's a great choice. I love that. So, yeah. That's who, oh, that's, that's right. That's right. That was before they cared about – <laughs> um, that's before they cared about casting people of uh, um, their ethnicity, <laughs> right? Just bring in who he cares? Had, he had uh, he, in that parking lot. I think it was like a parking lot scene where he was like making noises and like, yeah, I I remember. Yeah, Cobra is a good one. Their Night Slasher is a good one from Cobra. Yeah, so that's 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 my that's my number five. And again, I've got a, a great list ahead of me, so I'm super excited to chat. <laughs> sure. More excited to hear about Chris. What, what's your number five? My number five is also uh, Kyle from 1987. And uh, this is actually a female villain, which was unusual in the 80s. Um, she enjoyed uh, cooking people's pets. Oh, <laughs> and that would be Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction. Oh, shit. She is my number five villain. Um, it's a deep cut because she put a rabbit, a live rabbit in a pot and cooked it. Number one, Mm -hmm. number two, that scene where she's just turning the light off and on is terrifying in and of itself. She doesn't have to say a word and she doesn't. And number three, this could happen. Like this is real. This happens, has happened. I'm sure to people, this idea of stalking, you know, typically is more uh, men than women that stalk, but a real thing, and that's what makes it scary to me. So that's love it. Favorite. Yeah, Alex Forrest. Okay, that's a fantastic first round of picks. Yeah. So let's get to number four. I am in the year 1989. Uh, this particular villain would uh, play two separate characters in the uh, film. The first as a uh, how would I describe him? He's just a, an overall just rough guy. He, uh, he he kills this poor kid's parents, um, steals her jewelry. His name was Jack Napier. And then um, he became the Joker. And I am talking about Jack Nicholson's Joker from 1989, Batman. This town needs an enema. I love his portrayal. I feel like he's just this gun-toting lunatic. <sighs> And, um, I mean, I would never punch a guy with glasses, Jeff, just so you know. But <laughs> I know this is one of your favorite movies, Jeff. What do you think about Joker at number four? Boy, it, it's it, it's a great pick. I almost had uh, that exact pick at my number four as well. <laughs> you know, I, I really love the way you're thinking there. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jack did it right. He did it the way, and, I mean, not only as is, is Michael Keaton. Oh, wait, that other guy from that other movie we just talked about. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, re evolutionized, reinvented, re. Blah, blah, blah. He started over the franchise, <laughs> made it well again, yeah. and and introduced the summer blockbuster. Um, 
which you know uh, we really didn't have up to that point. Yeah, and, and speaking of doing it right, I think he kind of like ushered in a, a new way of doing business too as an actor because he was like, "Sure, I'll do it, but here's my list of demands. I want yeah. back end. I want money for the second one, which I'm not going to appear in." I also want to make my own schedule. I want a TV that shows every single Lakers game because I'm not missing one of those either. <laughs> and then um, I think yeah. he also had a piece of the merchandise Spilling. as well. Yeah, merchandising. Wow. Uh, I, yeah, all the action figures, toys. And uh, I, th I, I think reportedly he made in the ballpark of like $90 million, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and, and gave yeah. Danny DeVito, you know, this is how you just get whatever you want for a movie. <laughs> For the second one but uh yeah yeah that's a good choice okay there we go well uh, i'm gonna toss it back on over to you jeff with your number four pick well we're actually gonna go to the beginning of the 80s a uh, very quiet very unknown jets full pl football player gets wrapped up with this crazy scientist and this lovely girl and they get shipped off to space where they meet Ming the Merciless, played by Max von Snydo, who I believe invented the pinky ring before Dr. Evil, but <laughs> we'll save that for a different conversation for a different day. But that's who I have as myself. Uh, great movie, cult classic, great soundtrack. And do we really think, and could Ming still be alive? Hmm. I haven't watched Flash Gordon in a long time, yeah. but uh, I will tell you this. I have a, a soft spot in my heart for this movie because that was one of my dad's favorite movies. He loved Flash Gordon. So, yeah, I got nothing bad to say there for you. And plus, it's a great name, Ming the Merciless. I mean, I mean come on. Ming the Wrestler. WCW. I, I, love it. I love the I love the fact in the that 80s, even, only in the eighties do you have those names. I, I, and I also love the fact that they brought well, of course Ming was I think gone by then, but that um Flash Gordon made a cameo appearance in the movie Ted and yeah. felt like he kind of got his uh you know redemption from uh from Hollywood. Yeah. Good choice. All right, JD. Don't let us down. What do you have? I'm not going to let you down. I, I promise you. I can't promise that Chris will agree with me, but we've had our our, our bullies and villains conversations in the past. Like I said, I'm trying to do a little something different. And I'm going to go to 1987, and I'm going to go with a movie that includes sub-villains such as Captain Freedom, Buzzsaw, Dynamo, <laughs> Fireball, Sub-Zero, and say Richard Dawson as Damon Killian just oh. nails it as the yeah. big bad. That's a good choice. Special, yeah. Uh, I feel like thank you. I feel like we're very close to that right now, actually. Yeah, hell yeah. Man. <laughs> it could be in a reality. <laughs> I freaking love I loved I saw this movie at a very young age. Again, it's based on a Stephen King. Yeah. I don't know if it's a short or a novel. I think it's a short or novella. Um it's like exactly as you're saying, Chris, it's, it's very appropriate to our current timeline. Yeah. And it's, it's Arnold is, I don't know if you audience, if you've not seen it, I don't want to give away too much. Just go watch it. And Richard Dawson, just, if you've not seen him in his original game show hosting duties of just mwah, mwah, kissing everybody, <laughs> he's just fantastic. Yeah. That's a, that's a great one. He was a villain for sure. Okay. Well, Chris, you're up next, man. Okay. I'm going to go to 1989. And the thing about villains in 80s movies is there were some that were so good at being the villain. They were so pompous and arrogant that you just wanted to reach through the screen and punch them in the face. <laughs> and this guy did that. 1989, one of my favorite movies of all time. Of course, has my favorite, one of my favorite actors of all time, Patrick Swayze. And the movie is Roadhouse, and the villain is Brad Wesley. Uh, <laughs> man. And played by, um, oh, he's, he's famous, act, Ben Gazzara. 
Ben Gazzara, who was just like, you know, huge, huge actor um, and played this villain. This, this is an 80s villain. Brad Wesley is an 80s villain. Like I said, there's nothing, I mean, overtly huge about him. He doesn't have a scary look. He's just a pompous ass. And <laughs> he takes whatever he wants because he has all the money and he can do it. And, you know, we have people like that today in our society. Again, I go back to like, these are real people. Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction, that happens to people every single day. Maybe not to that extent, but it does happen. Uh, Brad Wesley, there's one of these guys in every town. And he was just perfectly cast and a punchable face. And just when he's like driving down the road on the wrong side of the road and he's singing his song and almost hits Patrick Swayze, I just, Brad Wesley, if you haven't seen Roadhouse, watch it. You'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, stop listening right now. Just end the episode. Go, go <laughs> watch, watch Roadhouse. Roadhouse. Don't watch the remake pause. that's coming. But... Finish the episode, then go watch Roadhouse. Yeah, finish no, the episode. No. Come on, Come on no, Jamie. Sweet ad. Roadhouse is better than us. We're yeah. close to 1,000 subscribers. Hit that subscribe button, people, if you're watching the episode. <laughs> and make sure you jump on the old train before it takes off. Uh, we're going to our number three picks, guys. We're almost right. halfway there. I am in the year 1982 for this pick. It is the third installment in a franchise. I won't tell you how many installments there are, because uh, oh, wow. that may give away too much. Um, I will tell you this uh, This particular character is played by a uh, an actor, real name, Lawrence Turiad. Oh no, you're gonna take it, damn it. <laughs> I'll give you one more little hint. Uh, what's your prediction for the fight? My prediction. Pain. Yes, your prediction. Pain. Yeah. Clubber Lang. Damn Lucky it. three. I got to go with my boy Clubber. Um, this, he was like the perfect bad guy. And, I mean, the truth is, I think Mr. T is actually just a really super sweet guy. <laughs> but I know, he's yeah. a really bad guy. He did. And, um, I didn't know his real name was Lawrence Turiad until I did a little bit of research. One of 12 kids. How about that? Um, so he's uh, made a, a really good name for himself <laughs> and uh, turned 70 years old this year and uh, still looks great. So shout out to him and a shout out to what I think is one of the better sequels in the Rocky franchise and because it's got heartbreak. It's got um, absolute just uh, coming up where you think Rocky's down and out and he comes back to get him in the rematch. But we had to watch him lose first. So, um, yeah, in our archives, I believe, J.D., we did cover Rocky three at some point, didn't we? Or did we stop at two? I think we stopped at two, man. Oh, we wow. have to do Future three. episode then. Yeah. Future episode. The Rocky three was the best one until Creed. And then Creed was fantastic. If you that new trailer it. looks really good. Yeah, the way. new one looks really oh, good, it looks too. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. It, it That's really a great works. pick, man. I had him on my list, so I'm actually going to shift because I have a <laughs> few here just in case. And uh, yeah, Clover Lang, I mean, just, you know, hey, lady, hey, lady. <laughs> that whole scene at this Rocky statue, just, I mean, for me, yeah. like that made him one of my favorite villains. And when you get into my book and you actually start reading it, Kyle, you'll see <laughs> that I talk about Clover Lang in the book. So just so you know. Clubber Lang is in the book. Fucking okay. love Clubber Lang. Yeah. Uh, shout out Paranormal name. Pat watching live. We appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, that's oh, that nice, Come on over here. I'll show you what a real man lives. Yeah. <laughs> hey, lady. Hey, lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. It's fantastic. Oh, love and, it. and, and I love the fact that his mom got upset at him that he had to swear in the movie. Oh, she did? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was great. I mean, even the name oh, yeah. Clubber Lang. Are you kidding me? Like, what a great name. Yeah. Hell yeah, okay. man. That's a great choice. Obviously, for me, I'm like, yes. There you awesome. go. Well, there you go, JD. All right. That's a little <laughs> note for you. Um, <laughs> but JD's not up yet. I'm going to toss it over to Jeff, number three pick. All right. So we're going to the year 1988. A young director by the name of Robert Zemeckis. Teams up with an interesting concept, one we haven't seen before, where we have half humans, half cartoons living in the same world. But we're talking about, for those who haven't seen it, 
Spoiler alert, he might be both. We're talking about Judge Doom, played by <laughs> Christopher Lloyd and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Excellent. It's a great pick. Great Just, pick. You know, looking at him with those eyes and the voice and just, you know, you you go from lovable Doc Brown to Judge Doom. And, yeah. you know, just a- amazing showing the quality of acting that Christopher Lloyd does in this movie is just great. And, and again, this set the tone for working with inanimate objects, you know, where they had some practical, yeah. where it was just a simple, you know, shoe on a, you know, a, or stick on a <laughs> shoe. And, you know, other stick times it was, it was, you know, a, a, a player you know, the, where, you know, Roger was hitting himself over, uh, it was just a machine that just kept on hitting himself over with plates. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my number two. I'm sorry. Number three. Love it. That's a great pick. I'm, I'm super happy that this made the list because it was just outside of my top five, but, uh, I love judge doom. And obviously we love Christopher Lloyd here on the back in time podcast. So yeah. Can't argue there. Now, JD, you're stroking your Fu Man Chew over here. Well, kind of a Fu Man. Um, could be a cool. Fu- you know who had a great Fu Man Coach Hada back in the day. Great Fu Man Chew. What do you have, JD? Number three. I'm heading to 1988. We've dropped the actor's name already on this episode. I'm not intentionally giving off hints. It's not shown up. Sorry. Um, <laughs> It's it's not it's somebody that I think can beat the crap out of anybody from that movie. Uh, Frank Frank Dukes does a good job of putting him down, but Chong Lee from Bloodsport in our archives is a massively awesome villain. Okay, and I think he's underappreciated because his skills are so good. He's a damn good fighter, and when he fights off against Ogre from revenge of the nerds in our archives as well ogre the only reason why jackson loses is because chong lee's a just a better more patient fighter and he knows and he picks his moments and he just well kicks him stomps him but mm. yeah so i mean i would i there's there's very few people in this world guys i i'm going to say this to you the three of you as a friend i would fight any of you at any time for any reason, I would not fight with Chong Lee. Okay. No, he would just rip my heart out. Probably and I'd good, be dead. That's a good, probably smart. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great quote. Yeah, you break my record, now I must break you, like my friend or your friend. Yeah. So um, the dub over wasn't great, but it's a fantastic movie, and uh, I love Bloodsport. I could watch Bloodsport once a week and be fine with it oh yeah i'll be completely honest with you uh, so let's get to the last pick of round three here chris bring us home what do you have i'm gonna go to 1988 as well and uh i am going to uh say that well this might give it away but <laughs> i believe that it is a christmas movie I know there's questions about that. (laughs) Nakatomi Towers. I'm going with Hans Gruber in Die Hard. And um, I just this quote here when they're when they're talking, when Hans is talking to McLean and, you know, I just want to read this to you because I have it up on IMDb. And he says, Mr. Mystery Guest, are you still there? And he's like, yeah, I'm still here unless you want to open the front door for me. He's like, oh no, I'm afraid not. But have you 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 have met you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child, another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. He's like, well, I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequin shirts. Hmm. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee Kaye, motherfucker. I think <laughs> like just like that. I don't know, man. Hans Gruber for me, Alan Rickman always played great villains. Um, but this was probably his best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I 
you'll get zero argument, I think, out of any of us. I'm actually surprised it's not higher up on the list. And maybe it is in somebody else's list, but um, who knows? Who knows? Maybe they have to desperately try to find some another top five. <laughs> and by the way, um, Die Hard is a chapter in my new book. Just lessons for Hell Die yeah. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. What's the name of that book again, Chris? Raised on the eighties. Find it somewhere. Uh, uh, not on the back. If you type in "Raised on the eighties on Amazon, it'll come up. There's a subtitle as well, but that'll. Well played. Well played. That's so we are three. getting down to number two. This is where it starts to get a little bit difficult. Choices have to be made. Feelings start to get hurt. Um, my feelings were a little hurt when JD picked this as his number three. But I am also in the year 1988, and I also am going with the uh, Bolo young character Chung Lee from the movie Bloodsport. I thought about pulling a quick one and maybe changing it out with something else, but I got to stay true because I love Bloodsport and it deserves to be number two. This guy scared the absolute crap out of me. It's like, did he only work out his entire life? <laughs> Was he on that Jose Canseco juice in the 80s who knows let's just, maybe it was all let's natural. put it this way i i feel like he's never had a pizza i i'd be shocked <laughs> and you know he he didn't have that glow <laughs> he did step on dude's head and crush it like a grape and um, <laughs> i was happy to see ogre make it out alive to be honest and uh yeah it, it made me want to never fight anybody ever because i was afraid of getting my head crushed so there you go. That's why you punch him in the nuts and you run. Your Learn that from JD. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. There you and go. Scream. That's my number two. So All I'm right. going to throw it back to Jeff. And um, yeah, let's. What do you got, Jeff? So we're going to the year 1982, and mm. we're going out to space because oh, this okay. man is known by many by one name only <laughs> you disappeared into the brick <laughs> i didn't want to scream our or blow up my speakers there are you doing that but of course i'm talking about khan from star trek to the wrath of khan yeah I, that's our favorite Colombian Latin bad guy, Ricardo Montalbán. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, when you said one name, I thought you were going to say Seal. Yeah. <laughs> one name? <laughs> one name? <laughs> yeah. The Wrath of Khan, fantastic movie. Shout out to our buddy uh, Phantom Dark Dave. He hasn't been on in a while. Huge Trekkie. Huge Trekkie. And, uh, uh, and I'm not much of a Star Trek thing. fan, but really enjoyed his performance in this one out of yeah. uh, all of them. So, well, you know, live long and prosper, as they say. So, uh, great pick. Yeah, there you go. That, oh, I, it's like the, I, I, I can never do I, it. I, don't I, don't even know. Know. I, I, I can do it's, both hands. Kind of actually. I just know, like, I know this one. Yeah. Oh, not there new, not new. Not new, oh not yes. New. <laughs> I was more too hot. I knew not it was a little West Side. Okay. Um, JD, what do you have at your number two pick? Man, I, this has got to be difficult for you. It's it's hard. And I'm, I'm going to throw down some names for you. And if, if you know the movie, interrupt me, and then we can talk about it. Okay. And then we can talk about the villainous character in it, um, played by blank. But uh, we, we're talking about a movie that's got Paul McCrane, Miguel Ferrar, Ray Wise, Peter Weller, and Robo of Cop. course, I'm Robo yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Kurtwood Smith as Clarence Bodiger. Yes, that, this is my pick as my number two villain, if only for the moment when he walks into the apartment and bitches leave and just blows <laughs> shit all to hell. <laughs> and my favorite part about it is the made for not made for TV, the TV version of that. If you've seen the dubbed over version, when he walks into that apartment, they he says, "Ladies, please leave." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, no, I love RoboCop's easily one of my most favorite movies in existence. Yes. I love everything about RoboCop. I love everything about, oh, my, even there was a Chicago Bears player, I forget his name, who was known as RoboCop because he looked exactly like Peter Weller. Um, who was that? I don't not know Gary who you're talking about. Was it Gary Fensick? No, it was uh, Jim something. I met him a couple of times. He's a great guy. And he got out of the NFL and he went right into investing and he's super well off. Oh. And he's I like, remember uh, Robo QB. Shout out Paranormal Pat Raiders. Uh, Todd go. Marinovich, one of the now biggest bust of all times. So, yeah, I, I did enjoy the scene, I believe, where uh, Robocop brings in Kurt Woodsmith, um, uh, Clarence, um, and says, uh, Would you like to make a statement? And he kind of just talks a little blood loogie right there in the state. There's my statement. <laughs> I love Robo. I and we haven't covered it on the podcast yet. That's shocking. That is that has to be we when we started the podcast, like a couple episodes in, we made a master list on a Google Drive document, which I believe I still have. That has to be the first ten movies that Easily. we talked about, and we never have gotten to it. So coming soon. That's all I can say. Um, love it. Yeah, look at Pat's pissed. He's he's upset at <laughs> us here. <laughs> God damn it. Go Raiders. Anyway. Um, let's get to your number two pick, Chris. What do you have? Okay, so this one would be number one for me if this was a movie that was a little more well-known. I will tell people that if you have not seen this movie, I have it on my underrated list. Um, it is an absolute classic when it comes to psychological thrillers. Uh, I'm going to go to 1986 and it's a Michael Mann movie when he was doing Miami vice. So there's a lot of purples and blues in it. And the movie is called Manhunter. Mm-hmm. It is actually, they redid it as called the red dragon. Actually the book was called the red dragon. The red dragon came out in 2001 or two, I think uh, Manhunter, the killer was called the tooth fairy he would take people's teeth but also his name was francis dolleride now the reason that he that i have him as number two is because he was one we were talking about serial killers earlier one of the most terrifying serial killers thomas harris actually who wrote the sansa lambs you know books was very good at this obviously and hannibal lecter came after uh we see hannibal lecter in manhunter but then he really gets his own in silence of the lambs francis dolleride what's so terrifying about him is first he was enormous He just towered over everybody, which is scary enough. Number two, this is the 80s. You had to get your film developed at a place, you know, like a Kodak place they develop film. Somebody developed the film. This guy develops the film and he picks his families based on their pictures. So he develops their film. He looks at the pictures. He's like, that's the family that I want. And then he would go into the woods behind their house and they would find, he would like sit in the tree and he would wait for them to go to sleep. And he would, he was horrifying, terrifying, terrifying villain. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name that played him, but incredible job. And Will Peterson plays the, uh, the detective that's trying to hunt him down and he almost becomes him as he's trying to catch him. So mm-hmm. Francis Dolleride, the tooth fairy and Manhunter is my number mm-hmm. two. Great pick. I, I remember watching that movie We're when early 2000s, when I was like just getting into the whole Silence of the Lambs and being so confused, not knowing what the hell was going on because it yeah. was so fucking brutal. I, I just, this is a terrifying character. And Michael Mann, you know, at his best, I think, when he was, you know, in his. I mean, he's done great stuff since then, but for my money, this is his best. Mm. So even better than he, but we can have that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have broken down five, four, three, two. It's time to get to number one. Who is going to have the best number one? We'll find out. I don't know. It's hard to rate him too, but I'm going to start with my rundown and get to my number one pick. I started with the predator at number five. Number four was Jack Napier slash the Joker at number four. Number three was Clubber Lang from Rocky three. And number two was Chung Lee 
from the movie Bloodsport. My number one pick takes place in the year from a movie from the year 1986. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. Chris, this one, I believe, is definitely in one of your books. It is one of the great villains, I think, of the 80s because uh, not only was he fantastic in this, but a year later he was even better in another uh, vampire-ish movie, if I've not given too much away. Um, give you a little quote. Um, I know he didn't mean to insult me. That's why I'm going to give him the chance of taking it back. And I am talking about... Kiefer Sutherland in the movie Stand By Me as um, one of the great villains, Ace Merrill. There we go. That's yeah. my number one pick. I I don't think he's that frightening of a guy, but man, can he play a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Kiefer Sutherland. Great. Fantastic 80s actor and then reinvented himself with um, in the early 2000s and had a heck of a run. On a TV 20, show, so one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite TV shows is Twenty Four, yeah. and that Sutherland family has put out some actors. I'll tell you that. So um, there we go. I don't know. Great, if I'm, great choice, great yeah. movie, great book, a yeah. great short story, I should yeah. say, by Stephen King. Um, and then, like you said, he's not the, so the best villains. Sometimes are the ones that don't look the part. And yeah. although he did kind of look like a bad dude in Stand by Me. You know, he could have blended in easily. Um, yeah. Which is what makes him so scary. It's the hair. The hair <laughs> yeah. frightens me. Yeah. And the delivery. Yes. Yeah. 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 There, there's another quote I couldn't say anymore. It's not PG for this time. Um, yeah. But yeah, him and Chambers get into it. So I was like, yeah, that one's a little too rated R for this one. NC-17 rating. Um, so Jeff... I'm going to slide it over to you, man. Give your breakdown, and then you'll give us your number one. Beetlejuice was your number five pick. Ming the Merciless was number four. Uh, Judge Doom came in at number three. And then, um, obviously, you had Khan from Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. What do you have as your number one pick? Well, uh, this is kind of cheating a little bit because there's a little bit of a tieback with this character and this podcast. But he shows up three times in <laughs> five different time zones, maybe, or <laughs> timelines, maybe. But, of course, we're talking about the 1985 or 1989 or 1990 of one Biff Tanner, Tom <laughs> Wilson, Back to the Future movies. There you go. All right. Biff Tannen, one of the great bad guys of all time. Um, shoot, I... I didn't put it on my list because I felt like it was just too dang predictable. But, you know, I feel like I should make like it's my first day, so it's OK. <laughs> yeah. Can I can I just say that the first two number one picks so far are villains from the 50s? Yeah, that's, that's just throwing it out there. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, Chris, favorite Biff Tannen quote. Do you got one? I think for me, Let's it's just spot. McFly. McFly, hello. Oh. <laughs> I don't just see. I don't know why. Just the way he says it. Hello, McFly. Uh, you know, actually, funny enough. So Tom Wilson is also a very funny comedian and has yeah. a song that he's written. If you go look it up on YouTube and just type in "Back to the Future" Tom Wilson song, and it's just a a, a um, song he put together of pretty much every question he gets asked every time he goes. Or someone asked him about Back to the Future. Yeah. And, Have you guys uh, ever seen it? It's good. I'm sorry? I was asking Chris and uh, JD, have you guys ever seen it? No, no, but I'll definitely look it up. Send it. Yeah. I, As uh, you know, luck would have it, we have the ability to, to play that thing. So why don't we do I that? would. Uh, and also, by the way, how yeah. dark is Back to the Future 2? <laughs> Dude, we have to have that conversation sometime. Don't you that cancel a, that movie, Chris? That is a dark, dark movie, man. Okay, let's. We got. We got. Kind of like the we second. Uh, the second Indiana Jones. Oh, jeez. Let's do this. When I'm flying in a plane or I'm on the street, there's a lot of famous people that I like to meet. 
They shake my hand and never ask my name And they start asking questions that are always the same Hey, what's Michael J. Fox like? He's nice What's Michael J. Fox like? Nice guy What's Michael J. Fox like? He's an alien Stop asking me the question I went to the bar mitzvah of my nephew Josh Now I'm not Jewish but I like to nosh Put on my yarmulke, started to pray When the rabbi leaned over and I heard him say Hey, was that real manure? No it wasn't Was that real manure? <laughs> No, was that real manure? It's a movie. Stop asking me the question. Can we take your picture? Come on, look mean. Would you call my friend a butthead on his answering machine? <laughs> hey, questions, questions, just fill my head. I went to my doctor, my doctor said, Hey, what does a key grip do? Set up lights. What does the best boy do? Help the key grip. What does a producer do? I don't know. Stop asking me the question. Do you all hang out together? No, we don't. How's Crispin Glover? Never talk to him. Back to the future for <laughs> not happening. Stop asking me the question. Hey, who's the nicest famous guy you know? Adam Sandler. Who is the biggest jerk? Gary Busey. How much money do you make more than you do? So stop asking me the question. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming out. God bless you. Awesome. The great Tom Wilson doing his yeah. thing. So that's great. Well teed up, Jeff. Glad we could play that. I haven't watched that in a while. I forgot how funny he is. So <laughs> hopefully he'll come to a town near you soon and start doing some more stand up. He's great. So, okay. JD, I'm going to give your breakdown and we'll get your number one pick. You started with the Night Slasher at number five. The, uh, what's his name? Damon Killian at number four, the running man. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, number three was Chung Lee. Number two was Clarence Bodinger from your favorite, my favorite, RoboCop. Did I say that right? No, but oh, who cares? Bodinger? I'm close. Bodiger. There we go. Bodiger. <laughs> anyway, what's your number one pick? What do you got? Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna tee it up a little bit with the year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it's 1986. I'm going to say it's a John Carpenter movie. Who? I'm going to say it's a Kurt Russell movie. And I'm going to say nobody on any of our lists can defeat James Hong's David Lopan. Big Trouble in Little China. That's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. That's a great pick. I mean, seriously, like I was, I, I tried to like strategically put my list as like who would win in a battle. And it was like, yes, okay. Kurt Russell defeats David Lopan with the help of Kim Cattrall and some other um, associates. But like, my goodness, I, I, if I was in an alley in little China and like, here comes David Lopan, I, I don't, I would shit myself and then probably just kill myself. <laughs> Not messing with that guy. All right. That's a good choice. I like yeah. it. That's a solid pick for number one. So I, I didn't see that I, one coming. When you said 86, then you said John Carpenter. I was like, is he picking Christine the car? Like, that's yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 like, wasn't John a Carpenter? person. No, no, that wasn't. That wasn't I'll Carpenter. allow it. Sorry. Okay. Well, let's get to um, to your uh, breakdown here, Chris, then we'll get to your number one pick. So um, we started with Alex Forrest from the movie Fatal Attraction at number five. Uh, Brad Wesley from Roadhouse at number four. Hans Gruber. Die Hard at number three, and The Tooth Fairy, not the Dwayne Johnson one. Get your minds out of the gutter. <laughs> Manhunter from 86. What do you have at number one? All right. So I'm surprised. Okay, I'm so glad that this one made it all the way through. <laughs> so um, this actor was mentioned before. Uh, I'm going to go to 1980. Ooh. And we are going to be in a hotel <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and we're going to be typing all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy. Jack Torrance from The Shining, played by Jack Nicholson, is my number one villain. Jeez. That's amazing. You get yeah. real serious. Yeah. yeah. Honey, I'm home. Like, that is just, I mean, that's, that, as you notice, like, my list was, besides Brad Wesley and Hans Gruber, pretty psychological. Like, these mm -hmm. were, you know, people that, 
for the most part, my whole list are people that could exist, but, um, but also people that were just terrifying and just the way that they handled themselves. Mm. So love it. Here's I love your reasoning you. too. Like that's, that's yeah. awesome. I love the way that you set it up. Obviously Pat agrees. <laughs> Solid pick. It, yeah. In your opinion, Chris is Jack. Is that, is that Nicholson's best character? You think? I mean, he plays so many great ones, but is that, is that the best? I mean, if you ask the average person, they will, you'll say, what do you know Jack Nicholson from? Yeah. I think The Shining is going to be the first thing that pops into somebody's head. If they're just, if they're somewhat of a movie person, mm -hmm. I, I would say that it's his best role in the sense that it probably is the greatest character that he played. And it's a very difficult character to play, the, the evolution of the character. Um, but I would argue that he was better, even better in One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, mm. which really put him on the map. Another Christopher um, Lloyd movie. There you go. And, I, you know, I mean, to, to lighten it up a little bit, I love him in As Good As It Gets. <laughs> I was about to say, I mean, is it as good as him as Buddy Rydell in Anger Management? I don't know. I was going to say Easy Rider is pretty good, <laughs> pretty good as well. Yeah, Easy Rider. But, yes, I think Jack Torrance in The Shining. I mean, that character, you know, look, of all the scenes he ever did, the honey, I'm home, putting the mm -hmm. axe through the door. That That's a – it's the hard – it's hard to say that there's a better scene that he's done that people would remember, even with the Joker. So mm. good. So good. No and complaints. Yeah. And th these lists are amazing. Like, I think we, I mean, other than we had one crossover, that was mm -hmm. it. This is a pretty good one. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that nobody picked uh, somebody from a John Hughes movie. I thought, Chris, that maybe that might make your list. Maybe it's on an honorable mention. There's a couple of, you know, pretty bad guys in there. Um, but I, I well, let's, let's get to course, it. I mean, I have an honorable mention. Yeah. I, I, I was going to go backwards this time. Cause I love to switch it up second okay. time around. Chris, what'd you have for honorable mention? Uh, one, I had an actor that was also mentioned before and his movie was mentioned before. Um, at least yeah. you mentioned it being a vampire movie and that is Kiefer Sutherland is David and the lost boys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely an honorable mention for me. Uh, I will also say that an honorable mention actually has three characters in the same movie. And mm -hmm. depending on how you look at the movie, any one of them could be the villain. I mean, two of the three could be the villain or the other one could be the villain. Sure. Uh, John Kreese, Johnny Lawrence, and Daniel LaRusso. <laughs> 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 Who's the villain? I mean, now that we're watching Cobra Kai, like I'm not so sure if you go back and watch did, was Daniel a little more of the bully than, than Johnny Lawrence? I know. Stole his girlfriend. So, like, yeah. Terrible. Dick. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say also, um, I mean, look, there's there's a number of ones I could say, but Johnny Lawrence are back to school. Um, I, can't remember, <laughs> I can't remember his name. Oh, man. Um, the, the dude with the sweater around his neck in um, Better Off Dead. Yeah. John Cusack? Uh, no, not John Cusack. The guy, the 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 the, the, the asshole kid. Um, oh, okay. I can't even think of his name right now. Anyway, oh. yeah. So those would be my kind of honorable mentions. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, that's that's great. Uh, JD, how about you? I've got one that I wanted to name drop, and I, I'm excited to hear your guys's response. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think everybody in this movie was the bad guy, but Heathers? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, from Christian Slater all the way up and down, like, what is he doing and what are they doing? And the, oh my, everybody's a villain in that movie, are yeah, they that's, not? That's, that's great. Yep. Yeah. And great movie. Yes. I brought it up. Yeah. Okay. The Heathers, there we go. Fantastic. Uh, Jeff, how about you? Uh, you know, I had, uh, I actually had Johnny Lawrence as, you know, one of my honorable mentions. Uh, so actually surprised he didn't actually make the list. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, it, it, if I probably had to pull one out, I, I would probably have to say, um, uh, we can go, uh, again, the actor was named Arnold Schwarzenegger, the movie, the Terminator. 
the original. Yeah. Yeah. Uzi yeah. nine millimeter laser sighting. <laughs> this what you see here, guy. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I actually had quite a few that of I course. was like bouncing been on my list quite a bit. Um, one being Biff Tannen, but I left that out just to, I can't say back to future every time we do a list. Um, so I love um, Count Dracula from the Monster Squad. I thought was terrifying <laughs> as a kid. Um, the way, when he grabs Phoebe in the face and tells her that, like, shut up, you bitch. And she's like, ah, the and screams like, oh. Yeah, so that was terrifying. Uh, Mama Fratelli from the Goonies. Oh, yeah. Great yeah. villain. Great yeah. villain. Uh, and then uh, Charles Lee Ray slash Chucky from Child's Play. Um, pretty good villain. Yeah. So yeah, uh, those, are those, good. those were all on my list. And uh, I just couldn't put them on the top five. What can I say? Yeah. So that's it, man. Uh, I'm kind of glad we stayed away from the, the slasher films because yeah. that was actually cool that we didn't go that direction because it would have been easy to do you know, the Jasons and the Michaels and the Freddy. Freddy yeah. Mm -hmm. Aliens. Totally. Candyman. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all those 90s, slasher films. Man. Like, Candyman. yeah. So I'm glad we, Oops. I'm glad everybody kind of did something different. It's cool. Don't say it a third time. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 I was surprised that we didn't have more on there to be honest. So, um, that's it, man. Uh, episode 270 top five ultimate eighties movie villains. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, thank you for, uh, Pat joining in from the chat, yeah. bringing in. A, I, I love seeing those pop up on here, so that's always fun. And uh, yep, Candyman always correcting me. Yes, it was definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Got to call me out. I was I was about to say something too, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of someone at the coverage. Yeah, but uh, Chris, real real quick, last time, uh, go ahead and plug the book one more uh, time. Let everybody know where they can get it, where they can follow you. Yeah, Raised on the 80s is my newest book, 30 Plus Unexpected Life Lessons for the Movies and Music from Pop Culture's Most Excellent Decade. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it in paper, paperback and Kindle. It's also going to be available digital. I think it's on Barnes & Noble now. Online, Barnes & Noble, Apple. Um, you'll be able to get it in digital form format sh shortly in a number of different areas as well. Um, you can find me at chrisclues.com, C-L-E-W-S.com. If you need a good keynote speaker talking about lessons for work and life from 80s pop culture, I'm your guy. Um, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all of those. Chris Clues 80s on Instagram, uh, at 80s pop culture on Twitter, and then Chris Clues everywhere else. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. Don't know any, anything about it. So. Perfect. <laughs> Well, we are not on yet. TikTok and you can follow us at Back in Time Podcast and uh, at Back in Time Pod on all the other social media accounts. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for giving us your time. Another great episode in the books. And uh, I'm going to take us out with a uh, closing podcast mixed down brought to you by yours truly, uh, Jeff. Here we Stay go. Stay rad, everybody. Later. Fun storm in the castle. How about a hug? I hate goodbyes. <laughs> Just go.